Hello and welcome to Tales from the Whiskey Office with me, Jerry McLaughlin, where we'll be having uh, some reviews of some good whiskies, having a great chat over a wee dram, basically. Uh, my guest for this episode is none other than writer, actor, comedian, good guy, co-creator of Burniston, uh, co-creator of many things, writer of on Tune the Fat, many other amazing things. It's it's Robert Florence. Keep going, Jerry. Keep going. What, there, what is lots of the, what there is lots of things. A, a creator of Video Guiding. Uh, State. Legend. Legend. Legend of <laughs> Icon. Legend. Wrestler. Wrestler. Um, self-professed god of games, both board and video. Yes. It's a pleasure to be in the whiskey office with you. Uh, Thanks for joining us. Jerry, it's a real pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Well, we're, well I'm going to get into it. It's going to be a career chat. Obviously, like, we've known each other for a long time now, and I... There are some things I like to ask you that I've never asked you before, and I, I like to see the look of fear go across your face there. But first of all, I've got a wee whiskey for you. We're here in the, we're here in the whiskey office. You've got your Pete Sense cone. I have. So you've got your little, uh, your, your the lovely smell of a, of I a can peat smell fire the, burning away. I can smell the peat, and we'll talk about that later, Jerry. Let's talk about that later. And also, you've had your wee pack that was sent from uh, from the good guys at Solace Productions sent this over. Saw so sent over your little glass courtesy of Glen Cairn. Did you get your wee pack? You've got your wee tails from the whiskey office glass. I've got my wee tails for the whiskey office glass, and I've got a wee bottle of whiskey here. But there's no so label on it. There's no nothing. I don't know. There what is. This is. Doesn't need label on it. So I tell you what we'll do. Let's decant it right now. Decant seems quite a grand word for just a wee tiny wee bottle, doesn't it? Does but that mean pour? Does it mean pour? It means it means take the liquid and put it into a different shaped container. Okay. Oh, no, it's well, hold on, hold on. Listen to us. Let's hear it. Hold on, moment. That's nice. Oh, you're not you're not peeing, are you, Robert? Because no. this is How a podcast. We should I pour the whole thing in? Yeah. Pour the whole thing in, right? There we go. Now these the, the Glen Cairn glasses are perfect snifter glasses, right? So, a wee tip I was given: if you're sniffing your your glass, mm -hmm. I would open, keep your mouth open at the same time. Okay. And just breathe that in, and I'll tell you that the whiskey that we're smelling right now is Scapa the Orcadian. And it's the Glanza expression. There's two expressions from uh, from Scapa. Scapa is, of course, from Orkney. One of only oh, you hear us sniffing, isn't it? One of only two uh, distilleries on the island. The other one, of course, being Highland Park. Maybe maybe the more famous one, I would say, to be fair. But Scapa do some great. These two great expressions that they've got at the moment are fantastic. Now, what's your first instincts there? What 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 are you getting from that there, Robert? Well, well, first of all, I just want to say that's quite interesting that it's got two expressions because that's uh, my acting method as well. But two expressions. <laughs> You've got uh, shouting and not shouting. <laughs> yeah, loud and quiet. Right. What am I getting for it? Yeah. See, I'm smelling peat. This is the problem because I'm smelling peat, but I think it might be for the peat cone. No, no, you're actually, you're actually right because this expression, this this particular scapa is... Um, the other one's called Skidden, and I think this one actually is a wee bit peated, which is kind of a wee bit more unusual. You obviously you associate that with the Eiley malts and stuff, but this one is a wee bit peated, so you're on the money there, Robert. Are you, are you a big whiskey fan yourself normally? I need to be honest, I don't drink a lot of whiskey. Um, uh -huh. I don't drink a lot of whiskey. I'm very a cognac guy. Right, but, okay. But I do like a wee whiskey, you know, on occasion, certainly. Uh -huh. Well, this is an interesting one to start with because a lot of people do get put off by really strong peaty whiskeys, and this isn't it. There is just a wee hint of it there. I'll read, I'll read you out some of the, um, you, you'll love this, some of the uh, smelling notes. So you're, you're looking Can I guess something else? Of, Can I guess something else? Please do guess. I'll tell you what, there's three main ones. There's four main ones on there, and I'll give you a wee point if you get some of the expressions. So you got Pete, so you get a ding, 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 ding for that one. I feel as if there's a heathery smell to it. There's a heathery kind of smell. <laughs> if you read, you no, I haven't. Up, honestly, haven't read it. I have. <laughs> but I'll tell yeah. you something. Ding, 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 ding. You've got another one there. That's that's tremendous for a cognac lover. Genuinely, and, and it, though, Jerry, I do actually have. I'm quite good at this. Like, see if it was yeah, like a glass of wine or something. I'm actually quite good at going. I can get this. I can get this. I can get that. And it's there. I think, I think I'm quite good at. That's stuff. really impressive. If that's the case, go on. Can you get the other two? Do you, do you want a wee clue? There is a there is a certain sweetness in there as well. Yeah, there's. It's my guess would be a slight vanilla tone. Well, do you know what that is? That is one of the, the tasting notes for the palate. But I think right. for the smells, it's more of kind of toffee and almonds is what they're going for. But that was really toffee impressive, Robert. Almonds. Really impressive. So, okay, do you want to take your first wee sip of this then? Aye. Give it a wee go. Let that sit on the tongue. I quite like it to go underneath the tongue as well. It's a bit more sensitive, your taste buds underneath the tongue. Yeah. And you kind of mentioned then that um, vanilla. Now, this is where it becomes much sweeter. 
behind this one. I'm getting a much more orangey kind of flavour to this one. Kind of when the taste, the kind of longevity of it's much more of a a chocolate orange. You mentioned that kind of vanilla thing there. It's much sweeter than uh, than I expected from that peat. I tell you what, it's nice, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. See, that's all you need, isn't it? Like that's it. Let's like mull that one over, as as they say. Let's kind of get on and have a week in a chat because, as I've said, we've known mm. each other for quite a long time now. Um, we basically kind of met almost through the the end. It was kind of I'm not saying pre-internet. That sounds like we're a million years old, and we're only half a million years old. But it was. Um, you were doing online gaming things yourself at the time, and people have podcasts now, they've got YouTube now, but yourself and Ryan McLeod started up um, Consylvania. And can you tell us a little bit, because a lot of people know you from Burniston, obviously in Scotland, and, right. and from maybe being a writer on Tune the Fat, but actually, tell us a little bit about how you got into performance in the first place, and, and did it start really with, with Consylvania or before that? Well, Consylvania was really the only, which is just... You know, uh, to describe Consylvania as just a computer game show that you do with your pals, really, is, is what it's always been. And that was yeah. really the only performing that I did, really, because I was a writer, you know what I mean? So that was really the only performing that I did was doing that. Um, and that was way before, because doing Burniston and stuff and performing in Burniston, that was like, that was the first kind of TV performing I'd kind of done properly that was you know, that, that felt like, right, I'm actually doing comedy performing here or anything yeah. like that. So I was a very, very late starter with that stuff, really. Um, what age were you when the when you recorded the the pilot episode for Burniston? Oh, man. Yeah, I must have been, I must have been about 33, something like that, 32, 33, 32, yeah. something like that. I think. And when you think you're, you're, you're maybe like talking with performers and maybe had someone set that like started when they were like early teens and have yeah, been on I, set doing a wee bit and stuff like that and actually they've got like decades of experience yep. just of normalising the whole process and then you kind of come on afresh and it's your show. And I'd only been a writer so it was like, and it was genuinely, I know it's like almost like terrible to say this, but it was kind of primarily, you know, we're never going to make any money. Like just writing it, like just writing stuff, <laughs> you're never going to make any money because we were picking up, like me and Ian Connell, who they burn this and we were picking up, we you know, commissions here and there, working for True and the Fat and working for this show and that show. But yeah. you're always thinking to yourself, we need to, we need to come up with our own thing, which is always a dream as well, to have your own sketch show and stuff like that. Um, and so ultimately we went, right, let's day one and say, we're going to be in this. Right. You know, we, we are going to be in this. And, that, you know, that was really it. It's like, I mean, I've, you know yourself, Jerry, I don't, I've not been in anybody else's stuff or anything. Like, I don't go and audition for things or anything like that. Oh. Um. I don't well, let like, me take you back then. So how did that start? Like, So it's the partnership with Ian that mm -hmm. kind of leads to all that. So how did your partnership with Ian, you know, it was Ian someone you knew from, from North Glasgow anyway. Is that how it happened? Or had you been kind of paired together? How did that relationship start? And how did it lead to writing together? What what inspired you to go, let, let, let's make this a wee bit more professional? Was it just a laugh to start with? I was at school and I had pals at school. I had a pal called Paul Doonan at school and Paul Doonan went to a theatre company called Toonspeak. And he says to me, there's this guy called Ian Connell at Toonspeak and you need to meet him. He's really funny. And he, you'd, you'd, you'd go on with him really well. And when I eventually when I went to Toonspeak and I didn't really go to Toonspeak because I was interested in drama or being an actor, but it was just, it was like a, you know, there was people I knew were gone and it was mere like just a thing a day. And there was lassies gone and stuff, you know what I mean? And I kind of thought, I'll go, <laughs> I'll go to this. And then I'll maybe meet this Ian Connell guy there. But at that time, Ian's a year older than me. And it, and you know what it's like? Like, see, when you're 15, 16, a year older is like a hundred years older. You know what I mean? Uh, it's yeah. like it's a yeah. lot. And so he was like kind of doing his own thing. And he was kind of and you know, he was just a kind of a year ahead. But eventually, you know, eventually we did kind of get to know each other when we were writing a pantomime for the theater company. We were, you know, uh. we go together to write a panto and you know, we because they kind of supported the theatre company, got right behind the young team that wanted to do writing as well. So, had he been like, going there for a year or so, or he been going there for, quite embedded there? He was like comfortable, and then you kind of strut yourself in and go, I felt we should meet, mate, kind of thing. He'd been there, but it wasn't even like that because it wasn't even yeah. like, you know, we, we kind of met in passing almost when I was there, you know what I mean? And it was mere when we started doing this pantomime, and you know, we were up the flats with this guy called Ian Boyce. It was up his flat, up the Redwood Flats. And 
Ian would come and Paul Doonan would come and we would all be writing together and Ian would always bring coca noodles with him and he'd always be, I was like, look at this weird guy who only eats <laughs> coca noodles. And and then it was after that, actually, it was like, we that was how we got to know each other a wee bit and we definitely clicked there. And then it was, a you know, it was I think it was a couple of years later, actually, that Ian got in touch with me and he was like, you fancy getting together to just write some stuff just independently? Yeah. And I was like, aye, why no? And they started kind of coming up to mine and, and we started writing stuff. This is when we were like... 17, 18, stuff like that. And did, then, did you write sketches from the start or was, did you start with just kind of wee things or, I mean, what was your background in terms of writing? I mean, who who taught you to write? What who, what structure did, did you have or what was your impression of writing when you guys started it? Or, or well, did you just have to find your own way? I'll tell you this anew, right? And I don't, I don't think I've ever said this in any interview, but the first thing me and Ian have written, uh, the first thing we wrote together was, you know, and this is just ridiculous when you think about it now, but it was like the first thing these two 17, 18 year old guys thought, right, who were into comedy, thought of doing when they were writing the first thing was a film, like a feature film thriller about this kind of gangster guy that was called, Small. Yeah. It was called Miller, I remember. It was the name of it, Miller. And it was about this, about this, like, I don't know. It was, I have still got it somewhere. I've still got all this stuff. Like, I've got all the kind of hard copy stuff of me and Ian's yeah. career. Um, up, up my kill room, as I call it. It's like this, this cupboard I've got up halfway up my kitchen wall. It's a weird thing. Um, what so kind of guy was kind of, Miller? Uh, what kind of guy? Who Miller was, was like, Who was Miller? He was a really dodgy guy that lived up Aye. the flats. And he, of course he was. I can't even remember what the angle was. I can't remember. Anyway, regardless, we are writing together and we're enjoying it. We're kind of just enjoying clicking the lang and stuff. And then Ian went for a, an audition. Because Ian was still trying to do a wee bit of acting back then. I wasn't interested in acting. Ian went for an audition at the BBC and he didn't get he didn't get the part. But after the audition, the guy who was there said, um, what was that thing you were performing? What were you performing? Because, you know, you could just bring in your own thing to perform. Uh -huh. And it was something that we'd written together. It was, um, no way. It was like a wee kind of sketch thing that we'd written together. And so he says, oh, it's a thing me and my mate wrote. And the guy was like, send in me a stuff. That was how it started. It was a guy. Well, a guy mean, the guy was called Neil Clark. Guy at the BBC called Neil Clark, and he got us a start. What a double edged sword to be to go in for a casting and get told, "Listen, mate, that's not good enough." However, aye, <laughs> aye. but good, good on Ian to like to see like the, the benefit of that and go like here. Performance was rotten, but that material was dynamite. Uh, aye, so that was it, and then we went and started sending stuff, and then we had a first commission. We had a commission for a BBC Scotland radio pilot when we were like nineteen. I was like. I think I was 19, he was 20, and we got a first commission. Aye. I knew it was fucking almost 25 years later. And was that was that first commission? Was that writing for Tune the Fat at the time? Um no. A first com no, a first commission was was a, a sitcom pilot thing called Dodgy Geezers, it was called, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which was right. this uh, it was this weird idea we had about like just all these kind of weird characters that came together in this group to kind of discuss their lives or something, right? It was like probably not very good. Right? I kind of really remember. Yeah. Off the back of that, we get work uh, writing on a BBC Scotland radio show called Velvet Cabaret. Um, and then for that, for Velvet Cabaret, then we were on Chewing the Fat. And it kind of went on for there. And did that feel like a, a big breakthrough kind of moment? Because obviously Chewing the Fat was such a big part of... Um, Scottish culture, it kind of entered into all those kind of catchphrases and things like that. And to be part of that kind of scene, did that feel like that was the first you're moving in the, the really in the right direction and, and maybe even give you the, the taste? Or was it at that point you went, we need to be in this stuff if we're really going to kind of push on here? Well, I remember being, I remember being in um, Balbeer's Balte Bar, I think <laughs> it was called Indian Restaurant in the Tune, which was across the road for the Odeon. And I remember being in there one night. Um, and here in another table, I was just having my dinner and I was going, you know, just having a nice night out. And then I heard somebody at another table say a line. And oh. I was like, I've written that. I've written Aye. that line. You know what I mean? Amazing. And that was kind of the first time where I thought, oh, here, there's something happening here. Obviously, yeah. getting your first credit on telly and all that is brilliant. And chewing the fat was great as well. It was like you were sending stuff in. And, you know, if anything, Ford and Greg were making it funnier, the stuff you sent yeah. in, which is... Yeah like the opposite of what normally happens. So, um. <laughs> Do you know what's really funny? See, from like working with you for years and like reading all the sketches and all the sketches that don't make it onto Berniston, mm -hmm. I think that when I look at Tune the Fat, I could tell what sketches you and Ian have written fairly easily. I think I, think I could, I could kind of guess ones. 
you know, you, you don't normally say which ones you've written do you on, on Tuesday. It doesn't yeah. work like that, does it? You kind of get the credit, but um, I would I would put money on the big man being something that you and Ian have written, but maybe, maybe even more you, if I'm honest. I think we've, and, defi- uh, we've definitely got a very particular <laughs> style, I think, of, of comedy, I think. Yeah. Um, I think we've got a particular style. But but anyway, in terms of meeting you, Jerry, oh. I kind of came in for the other direction because while I was writing stuff and I, and I was, you know, and I was a jobbing gag writer, I would call myself, I was like working with Ian and getting sketch show commissions and stuff like that and I was doing some writing for stand-ups and I was doing just bits and pieces everywhere I thought to myself oh, man I love computer games I wish I, I'm going to do a show about computer games and and you know Ryan McLeod who was my mate at the time and still is my mate uh, who I met at school as well met him before did I meet him before I met Ian I think I met him before I met Ian maybe I'll run about the same time actually probably run about the same time um but we you know, I was just a run at Ryan's all the time when I was a wee guy. I was like always run at Ryan's and we were always playing computer games and watching terrible films and eating curries, eating loads of curries. <laughs> uh, and I was like, man, it would be good to channel this, to try and channel these kind of nights we spend together with mates playing computer games into something. There was a show, so we came up with this thing, Consylvania, which we were just, and, and we were talking pre-internet here, so we're, we made it and burned it onto discs, onto like, <laughs> CDs. <laughs> And we're yeah. sending it to people through the post and stuff, just people on forums that wanted to watch it and stuff. It was a really, really odd thing. What an amazing solution to it, though. I mean, like, people, you know what it's like when things arrive? Everyone now is so used to, like, Amazon thing, things arriving in the post, and you've had your wee Glen Cairn gift, gift bag as well from Solid Sounds and all this. When it arrives, everything's great. And you did that with a show, a show that arrived, like, in the in the post. People must have been absolutely delighted with that at the time. And then, it, I mean, now that'll never happen again, but it's a weird thing of its moment. Because obviously Consylvania is still gone, and obviously you're you're you know have been a part of Consylvania recently until we couldn't afford yeah. Jeremy Mayer, big bucks, <laughs> Jeremy McLaughlin. But uh, it's I've often thought to myself, man, how good would it be to send episodes of Consylvania back out to people by posting? Yeah. You know, what I mean, I kind of feel like almost things are heading a wee bit back in that direction, a wee bit more. Like certainly for me, one thing I've noticed, it's nice having things coming through the post, and it's nice. Like, I love computer games, but I won't download them. I'll, I'll buy physical. I like yeah. to have the physical thing in my horn. And I'm kind of wondering, you know, I've been starting to wonder recently going, I wonder if like Consylvania would be good as a physical thing again. You know what I mean? Something physical yeah. that people could. Anyway, we did Consylvania. The BBC, because they were still, they were working with me at the time. They were like, what is this thing you're doing? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? What is this? You're doing a show. Uh, and then they said, do you want to kind of pitch to try and get that on telly? We pitched to try and get Consylvania on TV. And then it kind of adapted into a thing called Video Guiding. Yeah. Uh, we started doing that, which was crazy, which is a show that would never get made these days because <laughs> genuinely the commissioner at the time, yeah, a guy called Ewan Angus, who's like a great champion of comedy in Scotland, you know, he says to us, to us we get carte blanche really just do what we want just you know make make a show about video games and he doesn't want to understand a word there there was no notes there was i don't think he would have understood any of it it was no no chaos wasn't it but he was just like just go and make it uh which was which would never happen these days it would never happen where somebody would say no notes just make the show that you think is right and it just wouldn't happen but also found a kind of key audience so didn't i mean the things that you're talking about there are talking about finding like that key audience and just giving them everything they want it might not be for everyone but the people who do love this thing are are in love with it and maybe do you feel that there's maybe not enough of that now see when you look at like more modern things you've worked on that there's been loads of sitcoms you and ian have I've put together and then now the Scots is running now as well, but you've had to really work at it to get to that point. You've had to really uh, pitch and really uh, graft yeah. to get shows through to get to a point where you've got something with the Scots and you've got that back in and, and maybe getting given that voice to it. Do you feel like there's maybe things have got to be a little bit too broad and actually things can be really successful if they can just find their audience? Maybe the trouble is, the trouble is it's like what our view is a successful show and what, you know, a broadcaster views as a successful show are completely different things. Mm. Um, for me, a successful show is something. I mean, here's the thing about Burniston. Burniston always got good viewing figures, right? I always get mm. good, healthy viewing figures, but it didn't get like phenomenal viewing figures like a Chew in the Fat yeah. did or a Still Game did or anything like that. If anything, Burniston has 
because of the internet and because of Facebook and stuff like that, I think it's given people more of an impression that it was a bigger success than it actually yeah. than it actually was. You know what I mean? But it was also a different time for TV. Is always, I mean, I remember being at university when Tune the Fat was still on and my, my pal at uni is an English guy from Wolverhampton and I introduced him to it and he just fell completely in love with Tune the Fat and bought the box sets. I mean, yeah. I bet you're looking at it now going, I wish people bought box sets still. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm just, I remember seeing that in the house. I remember talking to Johnny Watson about only excuse and people would buy the VHS yeah. and would have a party and everyone would come around and watch it. I mean, Aye. what a totally different way to consume comedy. And, you know, it's great now that there's surely everyone can get a little piece of it and what have you. But what I think is lost there as well with that sense of community and that sense of timing and sharing that moment all together. And uh, platforms are trying to experiment with that, aren't they? But I don't know if you'll ever get that kind of that kind of moment back. No, there needs to be, it's just going to take a lot more bravery and a lot more, ex, you know, a, a kind of attitude of experimentation and, you know, not being risk averse. Yeah. Um, I think, I think that's, but, but then, you know, it's very easy. It's so easy for me to say as a writer sitting in my house, like, they should just, they should just give off a million quid to somebody <laughs> and just like, no worry about it. And, you know what I, I mean? Know. It's like Aye, things have to of, work or not at all, don't they? Aye, there's a lot of, really... and particularly now, the, the BBC is under more pressure yeah. than ever to deliver and stuff like that. So I get it, you know what I mean? I get why it's tough and I get why you need to keep pitching. And, you know, certainly I think as well these days, you know, being a, like I, I am the kind of guy, this is a tough thing when you're, when you're pitching TV these days. I'm the kind of guy you probably shouldn't be getting telly shows to like, um, you know, I'm a, a guy, a white, straight guy in his 40s right who has already done a, a fair amount of stuff and all that and i can kind of get why it's like you know give new people ch a chance key a mere diverse audience a chance that is definitely the kind of the it, fair no, but thing. this is a podcast with two white straight i know middle-aged guys talking which is just what the the world needs right now but luckily there's some whiskey in the middle here and you enjoying your whiskey there how's that scapa going down have you had a wee i'm loving extra it taste I've, there i've not had much tea by the way i need to be honest so i'm like i'm abs absolutely hammered <laughs> but how I met you, Jerry? Right. You were on Channel M, right? Uh huh. Yep. And we were doing which was our, our, just for the, for the listener that was yep. a, a restricted service license, a local TV station in Manchester, and uh, I think I was presenting most things on it. <laughs> well, let's not be more Jerry, Jerry was <laughs> Channel M. You would turn on Channel M, which was a Manchester TV channel, um, and you would turn it on, and if it was like eleven o'clock at night, Jerry would be presenting a music show. If he turned it on at seven o'clock at night, Jerry was presenting a food show. Um, That's and, true. <laughs> and you had a video game show. Uh -huh. And me and me and Ryan McLeod, at the time when we were doing video guiding, we, and we still have this problem, we think we're the best at doing video game shows. <laughs> and we think we think our stuff's brilliant. And we're probably, we're less like that now, but definitely back then we were we kind of big headed and we were like, we, we are the best at doing these shows. Our show's the best. But I remember when we saw your show and they were like, this guy's really good. This, this is actually, and we hated every video game thing we saw. But when we saw your show on Channel M, we were like, this guy's actually good at this. Wow. And not only that, oh, he's also Scottish. <laughs> well, he's also kind of Scottish. Scottish, <laughs> Scottish. He's, Scottish. <laughs> right? he's, we're like, he's also Scottish. So we were like, let's get him up and get him to do video guiding with us. Let's, you know, let's. Yeah. Because the other thing was we couldn't believe Here's this guy who's on Channel M in Man Manchester and Scottish audiences maybe haven't seen this guy. And he's yeah. like really good. You know what I mean? He would be, and you're. Well, and you, well you that's, know, that's and very kind of you say. So it's not why I brought you on the podcast. It just wax my ego here. It's nice to hear. Because you, you're, you're definitely a massive part of the reasons why I came back up to back up to Scotland. I'd left obviously as a, as a young kid and been back up and down, but it was just good timing when things kind of were ending there. And I remember you sort of saying, I'm on up and join the comedy revolution. I think you just had the first series of Berniston and then we're looking at kind of put me in that at that time. And, and that's just been great. And for, for me, I, I was a bit similar to yourself, Robert. I, I started acting really, I was like 25 before I did literally my first ever thing. I was never even in a play at school. We just didn't have any drama wherever I moved and and then doing it. So I've, I, I know what you're saying about going on set and you're a bit older and almost having to pretend that you're fine with this. <laughs> this isn't ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. normal. No, yeah, no problem. No problem. Huh? What are you doing? And just that kind of nervous energy. And you need to normalize everything in life to be to be good at it. But that, here's a question for you Rob, before you go. So you've you've written a lot of the you've lot of sitcoms, um, you know, legit empty Scots, um, for the state. If you were to write though, I know state's not a sitcom, but if you were to write, what sitcom do you wish you wrote? What do you think is like a kind of perfect? 
sitcom. There's one that you watch here and just go, I tell you what, man. I does wish it need to be, does it need to be a British one? Or? No, whatever you want. Oh. It's a tricky one. It is a tricky one. Um, I would probably, I mean, I would probably say Cheers. Cheers is the perfect sitcom, I think. No way. In, in what way? Why is it the perfect sitcom? I think you've got a massive amount of characters. Every one of them is funny. There's, yeah. You know, there's there's no straight man on, on Cheers. Everybody's funny. <laughs> Everybody's funny in their own way. It's super likable. Anybody can watch it. Anybody can get it. Kids can watch it and laugh at it, you know. Mm. Um, and it's just, it's warm and it's cozy and it has a lot of heart and it has great characters, strong characters. Characters so strong that, you know, Fraser goes off and ends up with his own hit sitcom, and, yeah. which, which happens very rarely that there's a hit sitcom where a character gets a spin-off and it's a, yeah. a massive hit. We uh, try a lot, but it, it doesn't happen very often, does it? So, I, che- I mean, Cheers is the one. Cheers is the one I always say to people where people are like, have you any advice about like comedy writing or anything like that? I'm always like, yeah. watch Cheers. Watch oh, Cheers. It, it, it's interesting. I remember like my granny, <laughs> I was about to say she's, she's still alive. I was going to say it like in past tense. Yeah. I remember her because I was on TV sometimes. My granny thinks that I like, I run TV and gives right. me suggestions for all of television. Things like you should get in that Corey and what have you. I was like, yeah, 100%, yeah, yeah. I'll work on that right now. But she was once saying to me, she was going, she says, Jared, because she gives me my full name. She was, Jared, there's an awful lot of like horrible things on the telly. Like it's yep. swearing. And I mean, even kissing, she's not really comfortable with that. Right. And she was saying, Joe, why don't you just go make something nice? Just make something nice. And I was laughing. I was telling my mum this, like, what would Gran want? She doesn't want it. No, no couples kissing or anything like that. So it'd have yeah. like, no, no peril, no drama. It just have to be two wee women going into a wee cake shop and just having a wee blether. And my mum was like, that sounds lovely. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> so, good. Yeah, you're like, that maybe is. Maybe that is the market. It's well, this is the thing. I think it's for more people. I like a kind of dark, weird, edgy sitcom as much as the next guy. But, yeah. you know, I remember, you know, without, without getting too dark or heavy here, I remember when me and my wife lost a baby, uh-huh. we watched Seinfeld. Like, right. all the way through. Now, Seinfeld has its edge and it has its, but it still has a, it has a kind of, see, sitcoms like Seinfeld, they have a, because they're network TV, mm-hmm. they have a mainstreamy kind of warmth to them, even when they have a kind of edge to them, where it's kind of like droping in with friends. Yeah. And I think... You know, when I was younger, maybe the sitcoms that were like kind of edgier and about horrible people appealed to me a wee bit more. But recently, like the American Office, I could watch forever. Yeah. Um, and and it, which is a sitcom that did an interesting thing because it, you know, it took the British model, you know, and had characters that were quite repulsive and uh, and then and then progressively over the season softened them so that you loved all the characters. It was an incredible thing yeah. they did. Um, I mean, that's another great sitcom I would love to have written. Anything that would have made me money, Jerry, basically. Yeah, yeah, anything massive. Anything Joe, huge. I, I, I was still, I was walking through, me and Scarlett, me and the missus went, we were going through Marks and Spencers, we were returning some stuff last mm-hmm. week and we're going through the bra section and I can't go through any uh, underwear department without thinking of that Father Ted episode yep. where all the priests get caught in there and it's like nam when they try and get out. I just thought, imagine the amount of fun they must have had right in that episode Aye. like with all the nam and guys just getting twanged in the eye. There's I mean, that's so a much great, fun that's to be a had. great sitcom. Father Ted is a, you know, just a great sitcom. In fact, oh, I need to be honest, like if we're talking about British sitcom that I wish I'd written, it's Black Adder, definitely. Black Adam. Um, yeah, Black Adder. Second series. Is, second series is my favourite. last. Aye. Second, I second. Well, I do like the third one as well, but yeah. you know I'm a big Blackadder fan, so I think if yeah, if it was a British series, it would be that. I think it's it's great though. That kind of what's amazing about it is the escapism that you give people, and then when you see that something's genuinely timeless, like do you, you must still have people coming up to you talking to you about certain Bernison sketches and stuff like that. A friend of mine was at a wedding uh, in Spain where in Spanish two guys acted out the the lift eleven sketch. Now that's tremendous. Aye. So when you hear stuff like that going on, do you, ever, do you ever think you're sitting somewhere and your hair's just going end and you're like, someone's doing the lift sketch somewhere? <laughs> I know, it's, it's good. I mean, obviously that's what you're wanting when you're doing sketch stuff is you're wanting stuff to, you know, you're wanting people to really engage with it on that level, you know, and, and remember it and rewatch it. And so that's always good. And the challenge is though, you know, when 
when you move on to something like that, like the Scots, the new sitcom we've got, it's it's persuading people to the natural reaction for people is to kind of go, just aim at Burniston, just do Burniston again, you know yeah. what I mean? Um well it was my reaction, but that's just because then I would have been in it. But that was only <laughs> <laughs> Which is not to say we won't day Burniston again as well, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, Burniston, I, yeah. I, I would imagine, isn't it completely finished? You know what I mean? Um, I think you don't have to say that because this is my podcast, Robert. It's fine. No, but I just don't to. think... Jeez, I think, old man. I think sitcoms Sick. are... Uh, I think sketch shows are never really, ever completely done until, <laughs> you know... Until the people that have done it are completely loaded and don't need to date anymore. We're not there yet. Aye. So no, um, that's quite a long yet, time to go. So, uh, Plenty of time to go. I mean, I would love to do, you know, I would love to do a big live Burniston show, a big live farewell show is something I would really like to try and make happen. Um, because yeah. I think I think there's a lot of people out there who uh, have never been able to see Burniston live. Loads of people out there who like it and have never been able to kind of have one last big send off for it. So I would love to do something like that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you're just always trying, you know what it's like, Jerry. You're always just trying to graft and get the next wee gig or get the next, you know, that's the job. Yeah. That is that's the job. it. And it's always yeah, been yeah, the job. I mean, you keep yourself spread across a number of fields as well. Like you mentioned wrestling at the top there. I mean, I'd kind of forgotten that. And my, you know, what? And I was at that Kelvin Brawl night with yourself and Greg Hempel would organize that event, a you know, beautiful, famous venue. And what a fantastic night that was as well. A big surprise of Frankie Boyle appearing at the end as well. Yeah. I think I was with one of my, my cousin and his pal and they had to go and get the bus at the end. So the night had really overran, hadn't it? I don't know if you oh, man. remember that. I don't know if you could remember it with the pain of your ribs being crushed in. It had overrun had about an hour, I think, yeah. Oh, and they were like, did anything happen? I went, aye. <laughs> There was, a, there was a riot at the end and they, these guys took their masks off and it was Frankie Boyle and he just did a massive speech, a political speech at the end, which yep. as anyone who knows Frankie Boyle will have known what that was about and just how concise and precise it was and absolutely cutting with almost zero comedy in it whatsoever. It was outrageous. Like, this, is, was... this is absolutely insane. But that was an amazing yeah. night. That was that was an amazing night. That's definitely a high point in my career yeah. was, was doing that night, Kelvin Hall and Jim Watt being there where he, won the, where he won the title. Uh, back in the day and Dane has bit in the ring and he was like all teary eyed backstage and all that it was beautiful it was a beautiful wow. night it was amazing it's amazing there's something to be said isn't there about the kind of um, recorded performances and the fact that they can be captured forever and you know that there's a whole new era of people that will be watching Burniston clips on YouTube and it's shareable it's spreadable and it's timeless but at the same time there's nothing beats that moment that you have no. and the memory of that moment uh, when you do that kind of a live performance like that and you know, it's like you said. You've, I guess, Bernstein's never been tested on that that skill, but you, you have been doing it. Well, you'll remember with... Jerry. You'll remember Jerry Dean <laughs> uh, Bernstein at the fringe. Yes. And I know we're not supposed to be talking about you, right? But you'll remember yeah. doing that, and that was. I mean, that was fun, right? Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Was it's the lot... only time I've done a show that is completely sold out before arriving. What an amazing <laughs> level of freedom and relaxation. It was great that. There'll be people right to... now panicking about their fringe shows, you know? Yeah, it was great to be at the fringe and, you know, everybody's sweating about their ticket sales and stuff. <laughs> and we were like, sold out every night, man. And Everything remember the night out. we had to go to the big, um, the big theatre to do yeah. a performance and then had to rush back to do our show, remember? Yeah, yeah, you know, of course. It, it felt like that. What was it? It was what was the theatre we had to go to? It was the, the big, what's the big theatre called? Oh, the do you know that's terrible? One. I've just forgotten it. It holds a thousand people. You're right. I've just forgotten the big fancy <laughs> one in the tune anyway. But it was like a charity <laughs> gig or something, and we we did uh -huh. the first. We had a sketch in the opening of that, and the reason why we were doing it at the start of that was because we had to immediately leave, run, jump in a taxi, get to our venue, get up yeah. on the stage for our show. And I remember when I was doing that, I was like. This is amazing, man. This is amazing. I know. <laughs> Dude, let's do this every day. Oh. To be honest with you, see, at the start of rehearsals for that, I was starting to panic because I was coming into rehearsals. And I've done a few, I'm not saying I've done any West End shows or anything like that, but I've done a few big productions. And, you know, we're going to do Burnison Live and the fringe is it's basically sold out. And I was like, right, cool. You know, what's the set? What are we thinking about for the set? And you were like, you and Ian were just like sat in the chairs, went, don't know. Huh? All right, all right. Well, huh? what are you working on it? Yeah, me and Rob are going to do a bit working on it tonight. This was day one of rehearsals of seven days huh? of rehearsals. And we were just laughing. And in the end, the set was two chairs. And two I think chairs on a table from, or something. I think it was the, like, I, I was like two I was, chairs on a table. I was like, this is not going to wash. And it did because obviously you, people suspended belief and, and it allowed for much more freedom for people to see the sketch they wanted to see and what a response it was from the crowd. I'm completely night. convinced. All right. Like, see with sketch comedy and stuff like that you don't need a big elaborate set and you don't yeah. need all, all you need is like the cast and a couple of chairs and <laughs> because like, not genuinely because i think yeah you know I, i've said to you before jerry i would love to do a sketch show where it's like 
we have no set, no props or anything. It's just in the material. Ah, it's just <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'd love to do that because I just I would think... love to see Bunderstein at the Hydro and all the still game fans that have come to see both turned up expecting an extravaganza and they've just got you and Ian in ill fitting wigs and moustaches that are falling off. Yeah, they would love it. They would, <laughs> they love, would it. Love, it. love it. It'd be brilliant. Right, Robert, thanks very much. You know, I've covered almost a fifth of all the stuff I was wanting to talk to you about. But first of all, how are you, you liking your whiskey anyway now? Is it kind of um, had a chance to kind of settle? I'm loving it really, actually. I'm That's really loving the, it. The Scapa Orcadian, which is the and the it's the the Glanta expression. So a nice one. I think I think that's a really nice introductory one. You know, for people that aren't like massive whiskey fans, but you know, would like like a wee dram. Don't want anything too harsh. I think that's a that's a beautiful wee dram. I really no, do. No, it's no very harsh, is it? It's quite. Mm. It's quite smooth. That's yes, how it's quite smooth. It. It's quite smooth. This has been a pleasure, Jerry. I would be happy to come back on any any time. I think I might have to get you back on in later times. We need to cover some more stuff, uh, but that can be done later. Robert, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for listening as well. Uh, future episodes will be on uh, ACAS, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Big thanks to uh, Matt Ramsey for editing and mixing. Uh, this podcast is produced by Solace Sounds. We'll see you next time for more tales from the Whiskey Office. Slange. And thank you, Robert. Slange. Slange. <laughs>